I'm working on something called uh, Playing Dirty Sports Scandals for iHeartRadio. I'm writing it. It's, it's already been released in pieces. There's going to be 40 episodes, um, again, with Jen Brown, my producing partner. And this one, Ray, is I think would interest you. It's, it's um, sort of uh, sports scandals. So it's a real mesh of sports and crime. So for me to do the Ray Carr story, you're going to have to go bad, I think, first, Ray. Welcome back to another episode of Cold Red. I'm Ray Carr, and with me always is Fitz. Fitz, how are you? I'm doing great, Ray. Uh, it's the first episode of season four, and what better way to start it with one of my favorite people and soon to be one of my favorite guests, Francie Hakes. How are you, Francie? Hey, y'all. I'm great, Fitz and Ray. Thanks so much for having me on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Well, you host your own podcast, Best Case, Worst Case. You're a long-term uh, prosecutor, lawyer, of course, and we're going to get into some of that stuff uh, in the next hour plus. But um, I happen to know that you traveled to San Antonio this past weekend, a uh, favorite city of mine. Um, I, I was there at least once, the Alamo, the Riverwalk. My son was in, um, I believe it's Fort Hood there. Um, what were you doing there? You know, Francie, the before you go, Francie, before you go there, I didn't yeah. know Jim was that old. He was at the Alamo. <laughs> I mean, Good one, Ray. And I, I like it. it. And I remember it. And I do remember it. And I think we all should remember the Alamo nowadays. Apparently everybody should. Yes, I was in San Antonio this weekend. I was very honored to be asked to speak to something called the Young Women's Leadership Summit. It's a group of young conservative women who gather annually. It's the largest conservative women's uh, conference in the country. And it's been going on, oh gosh, I think more than a decade now. And the age group generally that attends the conference is somewhere between 16 and 35. I aged out, let's just say just a little while ago. So they don't um, get their speakers all from that age group, although there were some young speakers. I mean, it was a great, it was a great weekend, three days worth of, of presentations. And I did a breakout session talking about uh, being a champion for the voiceless and fighting child exploitation and how even when it's hard, you can do hard things as a woman. And I think, especially for the young women, I had some 16-year-olds in my session. And I think especially for these young women, it's important for them to know that there's really no such thing as sort of a man's profession. I think there might be, but not in my world, which is an, you know, these are all intellectual professions, not you know, like stevedore or, you know, roughneck or whatever they all are that only the men in, seem in, to do. Important jobs, nonetheless. Oh, yes. No, I'm not I'm not denigrating them by any means. But I wanted these young women to know before they ever choose their career that they can do hard things, even when people tell them they can't. Okay. And when some authority figure says you can't do it, you really can't. Well, I'm sure you are a great voice for those young women in that group there. It's nice when they age out about 35, they turn to true crime podcast. And that's, that's right. where we come that's in, right? Exactly. That's exactly right. And a lot of them had heard of Best Case, Worst Case, which was uh, kind of nice. And um, so, yeah, I, I think it was a great group. It was really interesting and kind of a. it's the first time I've ever been to you know, just a woman's conference, all the conferences I've been to have probably been the same kind of conferences y'all have been to, which is, you know, men and women, detectives, agents, prosecutors, state, federal, local. Um, and so it was a real mix, but this was definitely different. And, and a there was a fashion show. <laughs> Who were you wearing? No, exactly right. That's exactly right. Nobody uh, some other. Alert. Some other, uh, you're a well-known person in the media world and certainly the legal world, uh, but there were some other women there too. Uh, could you mention a few of their names? Or did you did you cross paths with any of them? I did not cross paths with them. I did a breakout session, so I got 45 minutes, but the ladies on the main stage, as they called it, only got about 20 minutes each. But there were some really big names in media and politics and um journalism. There was Alina Haba, who just finished representing President Trump in New York in that civil case with the attorney general. Uh, Laura Trump was there speaking. Megyn Kelly was there speaking. Candace Owens 
was speaking. Um, I mean, it's just a whole list of a really big time media figure. So yeah, I did a breakout session, but these ladies were all on the main stage. There were lights and flowers and music, and it was definitely different from a law enforcement conference, I have to say. Last question. I'll turn it over to Ray. But if next year Ray and I want to go to this conference, is there any way we could get in? Um, well, you know, you can get in. Men do go. There weren't very many. I want to say maybe five and one male speaker. But, um, hey, you know, the guys are always welcome for sure. And the times they are are changing. So, uh, Ray, you and I will talk about that. Yeah, why not, Jim? Why not? You know, Francie, I, you know, you had this career that started out. I don't even know if it started out here, maybe even sooner, where you started out as a federal prosecutor. Uh, which is a little bit different than a local prosecutor because it's on a larger stage. But you were you were with the Department of Justice, and then you moved in, and you're now working uh, as a child protection and national security consultant. Um, can you go into a little bit of your background and how you kind of, you know, wiggled your way through all this? I think it's yeah, very interesting. It's a, it's- it's a weird, kind of a weird happenstance that I ended up doing sort of uh, production work for, you know, true crime and crime uh, generally in the Hollywood space. But I did start off, Ray, as an assistant district attorney. Um, I took the I took the sort of the conventional path. I got out of law school and I knew I wanted to be an assistant DA. That's all I ever wanted to do because I wanted to prosecute crimes against children. And so I started uh, right here in Georgia in the Columbus District Attorney's Office. I have a plaque. Uh, there it is right now. Anyway, there's a plaque somewhere behind me that uh, says the District Attorney's Office in Columbus. And that's where I learned practically everything I ever needed to know. I worked there just a couple of years and then went to a different DA's office because my husband uh, took a job in another part of the state. And so I moved to a different DA's office so that we could move together. Um, But I was an assistant DA for six years and I got a ton of trial experience and in DA's offices that were sort of modest sizes. And and you just you had to try a lot of cases. My very first trial was my third week in the office in Columbus. And it was an aggravated child molestation case of a father who'd been abusing his daughter since she was in diapers. Um, And she was nine by the time I got the case. So I did that for six years. And then I went to the U.S. Attorney's Office and I did that for 10 and then I left. Well, then I went to the Department of Justice, Main Justice, still as a prosecutor inside the department, but on what's called a special detail to fight child exploitation on a kind of national global scale and be the um, kind of highest ranking official in the federal government fighting just that one crime type, child exploitation. And then I left in 2012 and I, I heard from my old friend, Jim Clementi, who reached out when he found out I had left the Department of Justice and said, hey, listen, I've just started a production company in Hollywood. I produced this show, Criminal Minds, and I really need some help uh, with all the obligations. And I think it's time that Hollywood had kind of a kind of a real uh, three-letter agency people perspective on the production side of things, not just on the talent side of things. And so I took a chance and gave myself six months and kissed my husband goodbye and got an apartment in LA and um, ended up staying until the pandemic hit. And so that was about four years that we tried really hard to make a go of something called XG Productions. And XG Productions still exists. It's just a lot smaller than it was a couple of years ago, unfortunately, uh, between the pandemic and the writer strike. Um, Things just really slowed down so much that um, that it, it slowed down to almost nothing. So now I'm working on different kinds of podcasts and writing podcasts and uh, still pitching true crime type series out there in the in the world uh, on my own and with some colleagues. Very nice. And um, we can go. I want to go back to your law, uh, your, your time as a prosecutor, but. Uh, You were the showrunner slash executive producer for the recent, uh, or about two or three years ago, the the reboot of America's Most Wanted, right? Well, I was not the yeah, I was not the showrunner. I can't uh, I can't take that credit. Um, That was a guy named uh, John um, Farrakhani. Uh, anyway, but no, I was a, a senior producer on the show and I was in charge of one of the 
a sort of a units, as they call it, on the show. And our unit was in charge of getting the cases and liaising with law enforcement to work on what cases were actually going to be brought in, what law enforcement was going to cooperate. You know, we had to interview the victims, interview the marshals and other law enforcement. Um, and then the production team on the Fox TV side decided which cases would make it on air. Good experience, neutral. How do you feel about that? Gosh, I think, you know, that's a great question, Fitz. Nobody's asked Did we catch any Um, bad guys? I think we caught a few, right? Nine. Nine bad guys in just five episodes. So that was, you know, that was a lot. We accomplished a lot, I felt like. Uh, So I was very proud of that. And I was really proud to work with all my old law enforcement colleagues at the FBI and the marshals uh, and a whole bunch of other local and state agencies. It was a great experience in the sense that it was it was a real learning experience, obviously, doing a network television show. And then I was also in charge of the tip line. And so every week for five weeks when the show went up on the air, I was in charge of staffing the tip line, uh, which the cooperation of the U.S. Marshals was absolutely uh, incredible on that. They gave us a space and helped us with other staff to staff the tip line. And then even after the show went down for the next, gosh, I think eight or 10 months, I was the only person manning the web tip line uh, and responding to those tips and sort of um, categorizing them for law enforcement and then sending them off to the appropriate uh, agency that had the case where the fugitive tip came in. So it was a great experience in that sense. From the standpoint of sort of getting to know how Hollywood really works and being frustrated about the kind of TV that Fox wanted to put on the air, you know, they really wanted um, white men who killed their wives, fugitives, and that's Mm -hmm. like it. So they were like, how many of those cases. Can you bring us? And I was like, well, well, there's some, but mostly those people don't flee because they can afford an attorney and and they fight the case. Most of the fugitives are drug dealers and child sex offenders. I mean, that's just literally, that's the, the largest batch of offenders that are fugitives out there, especially the ones that are international offenders, which Fox was really interested in people who might have fled the country and just made it more dramatic. And they did not want to put drug dealers and child sex offenders uh, up on the air. And so it was a real battle behind the scenes because those cases deserve that kind of attention. And they really wanted cases that they did not think had the, uh, they called it the ick factor. And so that just, you know, as a crimes against children prosecutor, that was incredibly frustrating to me. Mm. And Francie, I I remember when that show had its run, and you don't have to comment on this because I didn't hear this from you, but there was a host who, while trying to get the law enforcement in the U.S. to work with the show, the host was at the same time going on social media, denigrating, besmirching law enforcement officers, police. And I found that to be uh, an incongruency there, and I know some police and law enforcement were turned off about it. You don't have to get into that if you don't want, but uh, I know... I'm pretty sure it probably was a problematic situation, at least for a while. Well, it was definitely something that was being discussed. (laughs) Let's just put it that way by the production uh, and by the network at the time. Um, You know, people might not remember this was 2021. We put the show up on the air. I think it was just five weeks in a row in February, March, I think it was in 2021. And it was right at the height of the madness that was defund the police. And so there were a lot of people who, you know, work in the news business and in the media and culture and entertainment business who all fell on the side of let's defund the police or, you know, that ACAB, all cops are bastards kind of attitude. I'm sorry, I don't know if you allow cussing on the podcast. I'm sure somebody can cut that. Um, And so that was really frustrating because um, I think there was a perception out there that the production itself was maybe anti-law enforcement. And of course, those of us behind the scenes, especially those directly dealing with law enforcement, I certainly was not, and nor was my team, all of whom, I had five men on my team, all of them were former marshals, FBI, local detectives. Um, And so they were all in the law enforcement camp, for sure. Interesting. You know, Francie, um, taking a step back away from the production aspect of things, 
uh, this child exploitation prevention and interdiction. Uh, you were really the first coordinator of this uh, of this program, and you created the uh, the inaugural strategy to kind of address child exploitation. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, Ray, it was really interesting. I mean, I obviously I became a a child abuse prosecutor early in my career, and, and it's it continues to be the driving passion of my life and always will be. I don't think, and I know you all have worked these sort of cases. I, I don't mm-hmm. think you can work these kind of cases and be untouched. So when I had the opportunity to go up to the Department of Justice on what we call a special detail inside the U.S. Attorney's Office, um, I was appointed, I had to interview for the job, and it was something that was created by Congress in the Protect Our Children Act of 2008 where Congress mandated that the Department of Justice um, put into place a national coordinator and do a national strategy and have a national um, task force uh, to fight child exploitation. And so I went up and I interviewed with Eric Holder, who was then the attorney general, and he brought me on board into the Department of Justice to fulfill that position, which I did for several years. And wrote the world's first national strategy addressing child abuse and child exploitation with the goal of eventually eradicating it and just sort of doing a threat assessment. I know you all are very familiar with threat assessments from Mm -hmm. your time uh, in the Bureau. And so we did a threat assessment. What is the threat children face? How many of these cases are out there? How many offenders are out there? And so we wrote the strategy, and uh, I testified about it to Congress and spent, you know, several years gathering people from around the world together in a task force to try to figure out how to address the problem of child sexual abuse and especially uh, child pornography that transits around the world and is at epidemic proportions now. You know, um, I worked quite a few of those cases I in Philadelphia. I was the uh, coordinator for Crimes Against Children uh, back in the early 90s because nobody wanted to do it because it no. was such a distasteful uh, topic with all agents. But I'm going to tell you, as things progressed, and Jim, you could probably address this, and maybe even you too, Francie, is that it was like shooting fish in a barrel. You could have probably served one to two to three search warrants a day. There was that many offenders out there. Uh, yeah. And it was, and it wasn't as though they were hard to catch. Uh, I mean, Chris Hansen uh, proved that when he yeah. when he ran that show. Uh, but um, it, it did you find that there was an abundance of cases, and you had to kind of pick and choose with these things? Yeah, you know, Ray, that's a great point. FBI actually promulgated a. Um, Oh, well, they call it software. So they developed technology. Yeah. FBI developed some technology that allowed them, and this is not a secret, it was in the beginning, but not anymore, that allowed them to sort of um, troll different parts of the internet, looking for people who were trading child pornography images. And the numbers were massive. Hundreds of thousands of people were trading child pornography in this country and even more around the world. And there aren't enough law enforcement officers in this country. If you took all 18,000 agencies and had all 18,000 police agencies working on these cases, you still couldn't investigate and prosecute every offender that's been tracked trading child pornography. And those are just the ones that this very limited software system could catch. There were all sorts of corners of the internet or people just using their email, all kinds of loopholes that meant everybody wasn't getting ensnared in this net. And yet the net itself was absolutely stuffed to overflowing, Ray. And you're right. I remember a huge operation uh, over here ended up identifying something like 3,000 offenders in the United Kingdom. And those 3,000 offenders, there were IP addresses, identification, subscriber information. So they were identified when the information was sent over to the United Kingdom to law enforcement over there. and. They prosecuted a few hundred cases because that's all they had the resources 
to do out of the 3,000 some odd offenders that were sent over. Now, if the same had happened to us, it would have been the same kind of numerical shuffleboard. I mean, it's really, really scary when you think about the numbers of people trafficking in child pornography who research and, you know, Fitz obviously is a profiler, you know this better than I do, and Ray, you worked in the space. Those who traffic in and collect child pornography are even more likely to be um, preferential child sex offenders than those who abuse children hands-on. There was a study done in Canada about that. And, and so it's just shocking the kind of numbers that are out there. And as I told Congress twice now, testifying, you are not doing enough. There are not enough resources on this and children are being abused and we're not, we're not doing enough. We're not doing anything in some respects. Let me, let me throw this at you, Francie. Um, back in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, when this just started up, and the program you were talking about, just so our listeners know, was called Innocent Images. And that was a big program that the, that the Bureau started up and it actually ran out of the Baltimore field office down near Annapolis. Um, actually ran I've out been of there. there. I had, had a whole setup there. I was down in the unit down there. It was, it was really something else. But that's where yeah. all the leads came out of. But how do you see, and it's all, all of a sudden, in the last seven years, ten years, we have this blow up of human trafficking. And like, wow, it just started. And it hasn't just started. It's been going on all along. So connect for our audience the bridge from child exploitation to human trafficking, if you can. Well, you know, you're pushing my buttons now, Ray, because uh, human trafficking, especially sex trafficking, is something that um, is kind of a buzz phrase that developed Mm -hmm. by the State Department. Uh, you know, like 10 years ago when they started talking about trafficking in persons and forced labor and sex trafficking. And all of a sudden around the world, I think it was because the U.S. decided to do this trafficking in persons report and report to the world what countries were and weren't doing enough when it came to things like human trafficking, um, what they called modern day slavery. They coined that modern day slavery. Mm -hmm. And once they started talking about it in that way, it got all the attention. It sucked all the oxygen out of what I was doing. It sucked all the oxygen out of child pornography and child sexual abuse. And, and you know, which 80 some percent of it happens, you know, kind of in the home or in the circle of trust. And then instead focused all these resources, law enforcement, government, State Department, NGOs on this other problem. Not that it isn't a problem. I'll, I don't mean to say that, but on a scale issue. The issue of child sexual abuse and child pornography is like the ocean versus a stream. And so while both Mm -hmm. are legitimate, the, the, the scale and volume of the problems are so different. And yet sex trafficking, I think because they call it modern day slavery, it's kind of a, I hate to use this term, but it's sort of a sexy term. It's easy for people to understand. And when you say child pornography, people go, oh, uh, you know, get out the crosses and the garlic. I mean, it's, um, they just treat it differently than they do when they hear modern day slavery, which is something that everybody can kind of understand and want to fight against. And so I think, I think those of us in the child pornography, child exploitation, child sexual abuse, industry space, whatever you want to call it, have a messaging problem. And isn't that terrible that we have a messaging problem? It is. I agree. Because when you look at pornography in general, whether it's child or adult, it's a billion dollar industry a year. And, you know, usually the exploitation of children, usually pornography is involved in that. And they're being yeah. exploited through pornography, as is human trafficking. So it's yes. really, I don't see much of a difference in it. It's just like you said, it's a buzzword. And it's just to kind of give it, it's like that sexy type of uh, name that kind of, Drives people here, human trafficking. You go, oh my goodness, human trafficking versus well, child exploitation. I think, you're exactly right. I think it's something that the government, certain bureaucrats are really good at is creating those bu- buzzwords and kind of, mm-hmm. um, you know, pushing all together to drive resources. And what resources they leave behind has been the unfortunate story here. And I think 
child pornography, especially that gets trafficked around the world with all the advances in technology has just, I mean, I call it an epidemic and I, it is an epidemic. And what that means is there's an epidemic of children being abused to produce it. You know, you, you, you hear people talk about child pornography and it's really hard because that's just a, such a terrible term. But child sexual abuse images is even longer. People can't even say it. Or people say images of the sexual abuse of children, which is even harder to say. I mean, so it's just it's it's a we have a real messaging kind of terminology issue. But these these images are created by people who are abusing children. And that is something that we have been just, I mean, wholly unsuccessful at putting any real dent in. And, you know, let me add from sort of the other perspective here. There are uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, sociologists, and even state politicians looking to even change more of this terminology. And I know we've discussed this before, um, where uh, the word pedophile is not even to be used in some states. I believe California has passed legislation in that regard. And the people who are interested in having sex or at least, you know, fantasizing about sex with young children are now referred to as MAPS. That stands for Minor Attracted Persons. So, uh, you know, which, granted, semantically, it, it may still define what the issue is here, but it certainly takes some of the stigma away that I should be that I should be applicably uh, that should be applicable to to the people in, engaged in this sort of behavior. So. It, it is a multifaceted issue, multifaceted problem. Ray, you said a billion dollar business. Yes. I have a feeling it's several billion dollars. I, I agree with you, Worldwide, Jim, you know, all dark money. Agree, no agree. one's paying taxes on it or very little. Um, not that we care about that part, but the, it's it's just it's just running so amok and um, and it's and it's so sad. Adult porn, you know, if it's consensual, who cares about that? That's a big business in and of itself. But when the child stuff gets involved, it's uh, it's an affront to all of us as a society, and it's uh, and it's uh, it's hurtful to all of us. Most of all, of course, the children involved. That's so true. You know, when you um, you mention and and they kind of throw these terms around, and you know this, Francie and Jim, so do you. Pedophile and child molester, and they say not all child molesters are pedophiles. So that all pedophiles are child molesters. And just so our audience knows, a pedophile is someone that get is involved with children, usually 13 or younger, and it's kind of recurrent, it's intense, and it's usually based around urges and fantasies, where when you look at the, uh, the child molester, it's just any significantly older person that engages in a sexual act with a child that's defined as a child under the statute. You know, so it's that's kind of how it when you look at those two terms, because when you look and, and Francie mentioned earlier, the situational child molester, then there's the preferential child molester, which are two different types. And the preferential has a preference for children of a certain age. And the situational child molester is someone who is just the situation presents itself, whether it's a babysitter or something of that nature where they engage in it. And those situational may only happen once or twice in this person's lifetime. We're preferential. It's going to happen more and more and more. So I I remember when I was working this stuff, they said that although you may have situational, many more situational uh, offenders than preferential, that the number of victims handled under preferential is so much more. So that's just the, the, the victims are just out there so much more. Well, you're right about that, Ray. And that's why I said earlier, and people can look it up, uh, a, a psychologist named Dr. He's a research scientist, Dr. Michael Seto, who I worked with, S-E-T-O, who I worked with when I was at Maine Justice. He's Canadian, and he does a lot of research on this topic. And the title, and I'm going to try to remember the exact title. Um, forgive me if I'm not quite accurate, but the title of his study was uh, something like, Let's see, what was it? Sex offenders. No, child pornography possessors are more likely to be pedophiles than hands-on child molesters. So in other words, 
Yeah, Someone who collects child pornography is much more likely to be a preferential sex offender that you talk about, Ray, than someone who hands on offends against a child. Because, of course, that could be what? A situational offender who mm-hmm. hands on offends against a child. So it's that child pornography that really is the hallmark of a child sex offender, of a dangerous, preferential, fantasy driven child sex offender. And so. The people who talk about, oh, well, let's just create AI child pornography because then they'll just consume the pornography and stay in their fantasy world and never hurt a child. Those people are complete morons because everyone knows that there's a, a basic continuum. You know, you sort of jump over each little step that gets higher and higher when you overcome your inhibitions and eventually consuming pornography which they do to you know pleasure themselves is not enough and they've mm. got to seek out the real thing and that is an eventuality that no one really knows how often it happens or to whom it will happen like are there some preferential sex offenders who won't offend the doctors tell me probably but no one can tell no one has any idea no method of knowing or understanding when someone who is a preferential sex offender or sexually attracted to children will act or will, you know, avoid acting, nobody knows. And so, you know, these, these ideas are just meaningless. What we have to do is investigate, prosecute, and jail. That's it. I mean, it's just very, very simple. I agree. Of course, that applies to many uh, other types of crimes today, too. Yes. But just to true. kind of... Um, wrap this up we talked once or twice here about consent and francie you can um augment this but basically 17 and under in almost all i believe all 50 states even if the young boy or girl goes along with the adult who is sexually abusing them violating them it is in fact a violation and an an abuse uh, and and there are criminal uh, statutes involved is that correct all 50 states well, all 50 states have a, an age of consent, yes, but they're all different. In, here in Georgia, it's 16. The yeah. federal government age of consent is 18. So theoretically, in Georgia, uh, a 16-year-old could consent to sex but cannot consent to being depicted in child pornography because she would be then underage for the purpose of that federal felony. California, oddly, has kind of a high age of consent. I want to say California, maybe 18. I could be wrong about that, but there are various jurisdictions and it runs between 16 and 18 bits. And back in the day, uh, age of consent used to be a little lower than that. But um, And there's a new movement out. And I, I hate to say this, I don't want to bring up a really hot button topic, but it sort of always, it comes up in the, in the transgender kind of um, area where people are talking about letting children make major medical decisions. And if you're going to let children make major medical decisions, well, you have to let children make major sexual decisions because, you know, I mean, obviously the the two are at least I would say equitable in seriousness, um, if not even more so in the medical decisions. But, and so I worry that that argument to allow children to make these kinds of very serious medical decisions without the knowledge of, much less consent of their parents, will bleed over into the age of consent to uh, consent to sexual um, activity. And I, I, sir, I oppose that. I oppose raising, I mean, excuse me, lowering the ages of consent in this country because it is, there's just too much of a power differential between adults and children, period. I agree. I, I, I don't think it's a great idea to rush our children to be adults. <laughs> Let's let them be children. And uh, when it's time for them to be an adult, then they're an adult. That's why we have the age where they vote, where they go into the military, where they drink, all those things. They're children. Yeah. They, no matter how much we think, and we know that the, the brain continues to develop until someone's almost 25 years of age. So Very it's not true. like these, these kids are, you know, they, and, and you hear, I hear stories. So maybe you have, maybe you guys have too. That there's some people out there that have gone through some of these things. And then come back a year or two later and say, you know, I made a mistake. Why did I do this? And, yeah. and those are the horror stories. Um, and, you know, I think that's sad. Well, hey, listen, it's it's hard as adults to make irrevocable oh. decisions, right? I yeah. mean, you agonize about irrevocable decisions. Oh. And for children, they don't have the capacity to understand 
you know, irrevocable and those consequences. And that's why we do have ages of consent for capacity to consent to sex. And so it's just a very difficult topic. I told my kids and others who would listen, don't get a tattoo until you're 30 because you're a whole different person by then. Yeah, that's true. Luckily, my kids are older that I don't have to worry about what sex they're going to transition into because they happen to see an interesting website, you know, when they were 12 or 13 years old. And we could spend a whole episode on this topic, which we won't. But Francie, can I put you into our uh, cold red wayback machine? Ray, I think I just coined that term. And uh, (laughs) cold red wayback machine. I love it. um, You're an undergrad at University of uh, Georgia, right? Right. And um, you're you at some point decide you're going to law school and you were admitted. So you wanted to be even an undergrad. You thought you wanted to be a lawyer. And perhaps follow through on child prosecutions of, of, you know, sexual violations against them. Yeah, well, actually, Fitz, I knew I wanted to be a lawyer when I was five years old. Wow. Because when I was five years old, I was watching Perry Mason reruns with my dad, <laughs> starring Raymond Burr. And I don't know whether it's my contrary nature, which my husband can certainly um, testify exists. I don't know if it's that um, or just sort of instinct. But my favorite character on Perry Mason was never Perry Mason who I liked, you know, because he was always right. He never represented a guilty guy, right? Right, except for, I think, one time in the whole history of the show. But my favorite character was Hamilton Berger. Hamilton Berger was the prosecutor. That was the prosecutor's name. And I wanted to be that guy because he was really ethical and he was just trying to put bad guys in jail. And to my little self, that seemed great. And so I knew from very young that I wanted to be a prosecutor. (laughs) Even though there are two male figures, Perry Mason and the, and the prosecutor, any other lawyers in your family growing up? No other lawyers in my family, but I had, uh, I am very, I'll try not to get emotional because I've, I don't have either of my parents with me anymore, but I had a very strong father who, in spite of the fact that he was born in 1928, and so he was from like a different generation. My mom was 15 years younger than my dad. So, um, my dad was really a different generation. And so he had some kind of old fashioned ideas, but never about what I could or couldn't do with my life. Even when I was a woman, it's like, you want to be Sally ride. You want to go to be an astronaut. You want to go play professional golf. You want to do anything you want to do. You can do it. You just have to work hard. And so I grew up just knowing, never questioning, knowing, that I could be whatever profession I wanted. And so it didn't even occur to me that the fact that Perry Mason and Hamilton Berger were both men was some sort of barrier. I mean, I just never even thought about it. It was just, I can do that if I want to. My daddy says so. So I was very fortunate to have a dad that was um, very, very strict in a lot of ways. My friends called him the warden when I was growing up. (laughs) But um, so he was super strict. But but it he paid was also, off, obviously. Yeah, he well, he was also very supportive and very convinced that I could do anything I wanted to do. So um, you're in law school, and I'm sure you're sitting next to fellow law school students who can't wait to get out there and work for some big uh, law firm, corporation, make those big bucks. But the whole time you're saying, hey, good for you guys, you know, no problem. I'm going another route. And uh, that was just implanted in you somehow, and that was your – that was the direction you were taking, it seems, all three all three years of law school. Yeah, I never thought about doing anything else. I never wanted to do anything else. I went to law school to be a prosecutor. And so it was why when I, when I graduated from law school, I went to a little law school in Ohio because at the University of Georgia, I don't know uh, what y'all's experience in college was, but University of Georgia is, let's just say it's a bit of a party school. And so maybe I didn't take my studies there quite as seriously as I should have. So I went to a very small school in Ohio for law school. And, um, but I always knew I wanted to be a a prosecutor and I, it took me a while to become one because I graduated from law school and I went to a small law school and came home to Georgia and nobody here had ever even heard of the law school I went to. So I had a hard time getting a job. I went to, I think, nine different DAs and solicitor's office. DAs do felonies in Georgia. Solicitors do misdemeanors. Uh, Nine different offices here in the metro Atlanta area trying to get somebody to hire me. 
and nobody would. They said, you don't have any experience. We don't know if you're going to be any good. We don't have to hire inexperienced people. Go out, go out into the counties, as we called it, and get some experience. And so that's what I did. I went out into the counties and went to middle South Georgia for my first DA's office. And within a decade or two, you're testifying before Congress about very important legal issues. Amazing transition, right? It was really, who could have ever predicted it? Your podcast is best case, worst case. And I think in the early days of it, in fact, when you brought me on, I would discuss like one of the best cases I ever worked and one of the worst, whatever. And we've been through a few of those. Although I now, the, the theme of it, you're just kind of maybe discussing one case or several doesn't have to be best to worst, could be in the middle. But let me yeah. throw that to you. I don't think I've ever done this with you. Um, can you think of a best case and a worst case you can share with our audience? Oh, gosh. Out of all the all ones my, you've done. All my cases are so grim. And there's no um, nothing happy in these cases. They're all kids yeah. at some point being violated. Which let me just throw in here. It's a whole art and a, you could say a science yeah. interviewing young kids. And of course, the younger yes. they are, the more difficult. I'm sure you were involved in some of these interviews, but there are agents and investigators who developed especially, usually women. Um, yes. Probably the right thing there. Um, and they would, you would, they would get called around the country to come in and just do like a three to four hour interview or maybe a trial prep of a, of a young girl, young boy, three to four to five years of age. So, yeah. um, so if you want to blend any of that into best case, worst case of your of your career. Well, let's say it's so hard. Um, it seems like all my cases are kind of both all at the same time. But right. there's a couple of cases that stand out and that I talked to the young women at this conference in San Antonio this weekend about specifically. Um, one was in Columbus and it was um, just an absolutely horrific case of child abuse where you had a army medic who lived off base, but worked at Fort Benning, which has been renamed. I don't remember the new name. Um, Fort Benning in Columbus has been renamed. I think that's where jump school is too, by the way. I, I've been uh, there. The yeah. army. Yeah. So uh, he was married to a woman who was a legal aide in the JAG office. So he's a medic. She's a legal aide in the JAG office. And she had two children um, from a previous marriage. She did not have custody of those children. They lived with their father in Florida. It was a little girl and a little boy. The little boy's name was Tony, and he was four. And the father did not like the defendant, whose name was Thomas Porter. Um, the father didn't want those kids to come up here to Georgia to visit and stay for any extended period of time, even in the summer. But a judge made him. So he was forced to hand his two children to Thomas uh, and Andrea Porter um, to stay for the summer. And the day that Tony arrived, Thomas Porter started abusing him physically and sexually, curling irons. I mean, just, I can't even go, I just, I can't even go into it. It's so horrific, the violence. He would bite the child. He was punching the child in the stomach hard. And then he began to strangle the child around his neck. And he did this two or three different times and then used his stethoscope to bring him back and do compressions as he would kill the child and bring him back to life, this poor little four-year-old. Well, eventually he could not revive the child. He didn't call 911 or take the child to the hospital. He called his wife who was working that day and told her that something was wrong with Tony and she needed to get home. So he wasted all this time while the child is not breathing um, and is effectively dead. The mother comes home. She's been there, by the way. This is now about a week into the visit, and she has been seeing the horrific abuse that he is visiting on this child because the physical signs and symptoms were very, very clear to anyone living in that house. It was not a secret. She failed to get that child medical treatment or do anything about it to try to help him. Just so to be clear, them, she's the she's the biological mother of these she's children. She's the biological mother of and this, this is the boy, stepfather, yes. so to speak. Stepfather, okay. yep. So they take the child to the hospital, and the neurosurgeon that I called to the witness stand in the trial later of this case said to me uh, later that he was actually regretful that he brought this child back. 
because he said he didn't think the child, well, he thought the child was so brain damaged and blind, would never talk or walk or think because of all the damage to the child. He was hypoxic, you know, no oxygen to the brain for a significant period of time. Anyway, he did bring the child back. They worked on him in the ER as these ER doctors and nurses who I just have so much respect for. They brought this child literally back to life. And we prosecuted the case because the doctors and nurses all said it was the worst case of child abuse they'd ever seen. The photographs were horrific. They still sit right here in the front of my mind. I can picture the photographs like you're showing them to me right now. Um, and so we went to trial on the case and we prosecuted both parents, Thomas and Andrea. And I got to cross-examine Andrea Porter. And that was a proud moment for me and my life because I felt like I was holding her accountable for what she had done to her son and let happen to her son. So both of them were convicted. She got a 25-year sentence. Um, Thomas Porter got something like 75 years and is still in prison. And I had a picture, a, a prison photo of him to show the young women this this uh, year or this weekend in San Antonio. And so that's a that's a case that's both a, a worst and a best. Worst because it was... Maybe the worst case, I think, of child abuse I've ever seen myself, just horrific, even including some child homicide cases that I've tried, just did not have this level of depravity uh, and sexual violence that accompanied the the abuse with this tiny little four-year-old boy. Um, and so it's a best case because these two were convicted and the child survived. He is blind. Um he came into the courtroom and I introduced him to the jury on the witness stand. I didn't ask him any questions, but he is able to communicate, but he's permanently blind. So I'm glad mm. that the uh, neurosurgeon was able to bring Tony back to life. And I hope, I don't know where he is now, but I hope he's living a, a rich life somewhere, secure in the knowledge that his abuser is still, to this day, in a Georgia prison. Can you imagine being the father, Ray? We're, we're both fathers, that, and somehow the situation unfolded. You knew your kid wouldn't be safe with this guy. You knew, including your ex-wife, the mother, but you're, the courts force you to put to, to turn this kid over. And it's basically, from what you said, Francie, like a week later, the kid yeah, is essentially comatose. It was and, like five uh, days, yeah. Uh, unbelievable. And that poor yeah. father also. But, uh, yeah, uh, there's no, no good side to that case, but... You got two convictions, and um, and and the, the young man is still around, and despite being blind, he's uh, hopefully a functioning, you know, member of of society. I but, hope so. I sure hope but, so. But uh, yeah, cases like that can certainly take a toll on a person. Uh, so what what county was that? That was in Georgia. Yeah, that was in Columbus. That was in it's called Muskogee County. So that that was my okay. first DA's office. That was one of the first cases. Well, I mean, I'd been in the office almost two years at that point, but. Yeah, I was a I was a young, young, very eager DA at that time. And um, I earned a nickname from the jury. And that was uh, I felt like that was a proud moment for me. And it was just uh, one of those cases that you never forget because you never forget the eyes of the child um, just looking at you. And you'll never forget the, the father who you know demanded that I get justice for Tony. And so I feel really good that I did, but it's just one of those cases where while you guys, I'm sure experience this in your career, while you feel satisfied, you know, you're, you're pleased, you're, you're proud that you got the, the right verdict, the right thing happened. The jury saw through the crazy defense attorney tactics and, um, and, and convicted the defendants. The judge actually did the right thing and gave good sentences, but You've still got a child grievously wounded and, you know, dealing with mental health issues probably his whole life because of what happened to him. And so there's not really a, you don't ever feel like a triumphant moment. You know, they show that on TV all the time where prosecutors just exult when they get the right, you know, verdict. But I never found that to be the case in child abuse cases because there's still someone suffering, even with a conviction. You know, um, kind of looking looking you up a little bit, you just finished a, a recording of uh, a series of Cain Velasquez. 
Yes. And uh, I guess the uh, the offender was Harry Goulart? Yes, Harry Goularte. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, Goularte. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? I don't know if our audience knows who Cain Velasquez is or what this is about, but I'm sure you could shed some light. I think it's – I read kind of through it and kind of listened to some of it. It's, I think it's amazing. You're putting me on the spot here, Ray, because all of a sudden my mind has gone completely blank with the name of that Audible series <laughs> about Cain Velasquez. I'll th- I'm sure I'll think of it while we're talking. But um, Break, Breaking <laughs> Justice. Breaking, Breaking justice. justice. Thank you. Breaking mm-hmm. Justice, the Cain Velasquez uh, story. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that, Fitz. I don't know what happened. My mind. It happens. It happens. Blank. All I remember was the sports series that I did after that called Next Level. But no, I, um, with a woman named Jen Brown, who was a very famous, still is a very famous sports journalist and an anchor uh, who worked um, on MMA uh, as, a, as an anchor on television. She brought me this case, this Cain Velasquez case. It happened in California in 2021, I think it was, where Cain, again, it's another four-year-old child, where Cain Velasquez, who was an MMA champion, a world champion MMA UFC fighter, big, huge, mean-looking, uh, you know, bald, guy who just looks like he'd eat you for lunch. I mean, he's just an MMA, just a massive MMA fighter, heavyweight fighter uh, and champion, multiple champions in, in the UFC. And um, he had a four-year-old son. He had a 13-year-old daughter and a four-year-old son. And he sent this four-year-old son to a local daycare that was an in-home daycare in California that had been around for nearly 30 years. There were generations of families who'd been sending their son their, their sons and daughters to this daycare. And one day uh, his four-year-old son comes home from daycare and tells his dad as he's putting him to bed that Harry, the son of the daycare operator who lived on the property, had low red flag and who was about 40 years old, had um, abused him, had sexually abused him in a bathroom there at the daycare. And so Kane and his wife, Michelle, told the police, they called, they got the child interviewed at a, at a center, fits a child advocacy center by a forensic interviewer, like you were talking about earlier, a specialist. The child disclosed some of the abuse that Harry had um, inflicted upon him at the daycare over multiple different times. And the police came, they did the right thing. They arrested Harry Galarte. So he's under arrest. And what the family, Cain Velasquez and his family, didn't know was that in spite of what the DA's office asked for, the judge allowed Harry Galarte, the the accused, out on an OR bond. Mm -hmm. And the DA's office failed to notify Cain and Michelle that he was being released. It's not quite clear how Kane found out he was being released. Uh, Kane is a very big person in the community and in the law enforcement community there. He had a lot of friends in law enforcement. So I suspect uh, somebody tipped him off. But he allegedly, because these cases are both still pending, allegedly went after Harry Galarte and his parents when they were driving uh, in, in a car. They were actually going to get Harry Galarte's ankle monitor affixed to his ankle. And Velasquez uh, apparently shot into the Galarte car trying to kill Harry Galarte. So Harry Galarte is out. Uh, He was not injured. The stepfather of Harry Galarte was injured in the arm, was shot in the arm by Cain Velasquez, again, allegedly. And then Cain Velasquez was arrested. And then he sat in jail for months and months and months while his child continued to suffer and disclose other abuse to the mother. And the defense attorneys for Velasquez proposed all these safety measures, Fitz, you and you and Ray would be familiar with this. He proposed getting retired sheriff's deputies or off-duty deputies to self-impose house arrest on himself, to do a GPS ankle monitor, to, to pay for security, to keep him at the location. But he just wanted to be out and home with his child. Galarte was out and Cain Velasquez wasn't. And so Jen Brown and I did an Audible series, Breaking Justice, the Game Velasquez story, on this case where we were out there embedded with the family. And we interviewed Kane from jail. And we interviewed Michelle. And we interviewed, um, I spoke to the DA's office myself. They didn't want to come on camera, but we spoke to them. And a lot of the friends and family of the Velasquez's, including a lot of MMA figures. And they all said the same thing. They all described Kane Velasquez as a teddy bear 
And they were just shocked that he would take some sort of, you know, really violent action like this. Um, and both those cases are still pending in California courts. And it's been three years now. It's it's an insane pace that is going on in California. It's the weirdest justice system I've ever experienced. And we sat out there and went to some hearings and I've been following it very closely uh, through the court website. And they're constantly scheduling what they call a plea hearing that's not really a plea hearing where all the parties have to appear in court just to talk about scheduling like a motion hearing. I mean, it's the stupidest, most in insane system, inefficient that I've I've ever seen operate. And so Cain Velasquez and Harry Galarte are still awaiting their day in court. Wow. The, are there, I, go ahead, Jim. I was saying, is there is is there a closed circuit TV video of this alleged shooting, or I mean, can they even place him on the spot? Kane? Yeah, the the evidence against uh, Velasquez is pretty strong, um, largely forensic. There was a, a short video of someone who captured him in what was basically a high speed chase in his SUV, um, chasing the Galarte car. And there were multiple gunshots fired. And when he was arrested in his car, he had two guns, including one that fired the shots and, you know, sh- spent casings in the car. I mean, the, the forensic evidence is, is quite is quite strong against Velasquez. Now, there are some interesting potential defenses in the case, including a, a, a sort of a mental incapacity type defense that I would equate to a kind of a CTE thing. I know you guys mm-hmm. have all heard about Aaron Hernandez yeah. and Junior mm-hmm. Seau and all these people that after their death, it was discovered that they suffered this chronic, what is it called? Something, something encephalitis. It's a very, the CT is a very complicated term, but um, it's this lots traumatic of concussion, brain injury. Lots of concussions. Yes, exactly. It's a traumatic brain injury and it affects the kind of the judgment centers in the brain, especially when there's a, a, a you know, a, a sort of an instant stressor. And so I don't know whether Velasquez will try to use that kind of Self-defense, I think it's a little bit of a tough argument considering it was, it seems premeditated. I mean, I, Jen and I, in the podcast, we discuss all of this in this audible podcast about his various defenses and the witnesses we expect he might call and how successful he may or may not be uh, if he goes to trial. But the good news is on that case, so we really got to know him and his family. Um, the good news on that case is that he did, was finally released on, on bond and is out now making a living supporting his family. So um, he's under very tight uh, conditions, but he is out of jail finally. It took months and months. So it's okay he goes and beats people up for a profession, but just not shoot them. Well, it's funny you say that, Fitz. You know, there were a lot of his friends, his MMA community, who said if only that is what he had done, if only he had yanked Galarte out of the car and beaten him to a pulp, maybe he wouldn't have been prosecuted because it's just such a different kind of offense. And it, it just seems far less premeditated than, you know, taking a gun and firing recklessly into a car of other people. By the way, one of whom was Patty Galarte, the daycare owner. And that's another area that Jen and I got into in that particular Audible project was discussing all of the violations that had gone on in that to safety violations in that daycare for decades. Mm-hmm. And they never got shut down. And so um, there are a bunch of civil suits pending now between the families. And it's just a, it's a big criminal civil mess out there. Without knowing that case, we could close it, at least on my end. I'm pretty sure if there was a founded uh, uh, allegation of the abuse on this person's part towards the four-year-old, that was not the only time he's ever done it. I I suspect you're right about that, Fitz. And other parents hopefully are talking to their kids, and it doesn't necessarily mitigate uh, what what uh, Kane did in the car that night after the the car chase, whatever. But uh, but that could certainly be some interesting facts if, in fact, they were allowed to be uh, brought into any sort of trial, depending on sure. what case <laughs> the prosecution of the child molester or the prosecution of of uh, of the shooter yeah it gets and it's the same there. da's office prosecuting both i I, I am i am sure of that you had another uh, uh audio series well i was involved in uh, call me god and i won't promote you i won't give you a promotion yet but your title there was 
in, in Call, Call Me God. Me. Oh, uh, I think I was a consulting. That was my first one, consulting producer. You did a great job, and uh, I know so I was inter- I was interviewed a good bit on that. And of course, it's about the DC sniper case, and uh, you yes. guys covered it really well. And um, and uh, not just uh, you know law enforcement folks, but actually witnesses that were there and and victims, what have you. But you did another one about a uh, an, an athlete going from college. Uh, sports to professional sports. Ray here um, was a college football player, and uh, oh. I'm not sure if you talked to any pros in your senior year, but um, tell us a little bit about the the story, uh, the Audible, um, I want to say book, but you don't really call it book, project. It's, they uh, call it a, a podcast. I call it an audio documentary because it's much different than a podcast because it, it requires a lot more resources, not just people talking, which is, you know, a great, that's what my podcast is, but it's more than that. We have to go out for interviews and we went out on scene and I have a, up here at the top of my bookshelf, I have a, a professional NFL hat. I won't, I won't disclose what it is, but um, it's called Next Level um, featuring Brian Branch. and. We followed a University of Alabama cornerback named Brian Branch starting in February of last year when he was coming out. He declared for the pros his junior year. He played for Alabama as a star cornerback with massive statistics uh, there at Alabama. Incredible performance. And just a kid of great character who's from Georgia. We, we interviewed his whole family here in Georgia and interviewed him here in Georgia and all over the country as he was running around coming out into the pros and going to the NFL Combine. We followed him there. And then we also followed him at his pro day. I got to go to the University of Alabama's pro day and go to the field house like a journalist and report on on my first pro day. My husband was sort of beside himself. He's the NFL fan in the family, and he could not believe that I got to go to a, a real NFL pro day. And then he was really upset when I got to go to the NFL draft last year in Kansas wow. City. Um, and uh, Brian's story was just so incredibly gripping because he was invited to attend the draft along with 16 other top NFL prospects. And um, on draft night, Jen Brown and I were sitting in the media room watching the draft and Brian fell out. He did not get picked in the first round and it was a shock. And he was, you know, terribly upset his whole family, his agents. It was, it was a whole thing. And then Roger Goodell and the NFL asked him if he would come back for night two, which normally the athletes are not on hand when the names are being called on night two, all the athletes are out at their homes because they don't get invited there. But because Brian was still there and he was such a great kid, they asked him to come back and they said, and we're going to put you in a draft room. You can invite as many people as you want. On draft night, he only got to invite eight people to sit with him in the green room. But this night he got 25 and Jen and I got to go. So I got to go to the NFL draft in Kansas city last year. And as we were sitting there in his green room with his whole family waiting for the draft to start, the NFL commissioner himself, Roger Goodell comes by and shakes hands with every single person in the room, including yours truly, uh, which we took video of. Again, my husband's like, I cannot believe you're not even an (laughs) NFL fan and you meet the commissioner of the NFL and I don't. So it was a great series. Uh, Brian did get drafted on night two. He is with a fantastic team. I will, spoiler alert, it's the Detroit Lions who drafted him. And he and the Detroit Lions played the NFL opener last September the 7th or 10th, I think it was, of 2023. And it was on a Thursday night, and they played the Kansas City Chiefs, who were the Super Bowl champions at the time. And in that game, Brian got an interception on Patrick Mahomes, NFL MVP Patrick Holmes, and ran it back for a touchdown. That was wow. his first NFL game. I've never lost my voice so quickly in my life. I was watching on TV and I was so excited because this kid could not be any nicer. And this project could not be any farther from crime than you can get. And so it was a really nice, refreshing difference to go to the world of straight sports and a feel good story, a draft story, get to know this kid who grew up without a father, who had a very tough upbringing, a supportive mom, but she worked full time, three siblings and Brian. And, you know, they didn't have a lot. And he is 
one of the nicest kids you ever want to meet. So when you see him, Brian Branch with the um, Detroit Lions performing well, you can be a fan because he is every bit as nice as you would want him to be. Great story. It and, is. That's a, and that's available on Audible and other places. Available on, on Audible, yeah. Next level. I just hope if he comes down to play the Falcons down in Atlanta, that he gets you and your husband a ticket to go see Oh, uh-huh. well, I'll ask him. Believe me. We text. Absolutely. He's a sweetheart. Absolutely. He is a sweetheart, a sweet kid who has a sweet tooth for whom I, of course, had to bake some homemade goods <laughs> when whenever we went to interview. I'll remember that if I ever get down your way. For sure. I'll be glad to make for you too, as well. Of course, the big question will be if the Detroit Lions are playing the Atlanta Falcons, for whom do you root? Well, I have to admit I'm a bit of a traitor to the city. I don't know any Atlanta Falcons, but I do know a couple of the Detroit Lions now because not just Brian, but one of his teammates, uh, Jameer Gibbs, was also drafted by the Lions from Alabama, and we got to interview him for the project. And he's also a sweetheart with a hilarious sense of humor. He and Brian have a great relationship. So I know two players on the Detroit Lions team, so I have to root for them. The question really becomes, Fitz, if my husband's long-suffering, beloved Cleveland Browns get into the Super Bowl Uh against the Detroit Lions, then who do I root for? And I have to confess, it'll be the Lions. (laughs) Don't tell my husband. Just both going to be good teams this year. They're both going to be good. Yeah, I hope so. Cleveland and Detroit will both be good. But they yeah. won't beat the Eagles, just so you know. <laughs> well, I guess we're going to find out, Ray. Yeah, we will. <laughs> Ray, you have any stories from your college days, even guys before or after you? Uh, I played with, uh, with, and, and I still, believe it or not, we still talk. We still get together. But I played with um, uh, Bruce Harper, who played with oh, the really? Jets, New York Jets. And Bruce was on the uh, all-80s team for the NFL. So he's the all-80 team for the NFL. And then another guy who I didn't get a chance to play with, but I was good friends with because my first office was Buffalo, New York, was Andre Reed. Oh, wow. And um, <clears throat> Andre played behind me. And here's a story. I'm up at a coach's clinic because I was coaching high school football. And I'm up at a coach's clinic in Kutztown while Reed is playing. I had no idea who he was. And I'm in there, and a fight breaks out in the bar. And I happen to be in the middle of this fight. You know, it's a college bar. And this guy grabs me. And I'm going, oh, my God, who is this guy that has me? He's so darn strong. You know, and I, I was a pretty strong guy at that time. And I'm thinking, who is this guy? And he goes, take it easy, Ray. Take it easy. And I said, who the hell are you? And he said, Andre Reed. And I didn't know who he was. I said, well, I don't know you. He goes, well, I know you. Because, you know, you probably know the old guys that come back, you know. And uh, that's how I got to meet him. And uh, I went up there. He had a, he, I have a football uh, in my son's room signed by both him and Jim Kelly, both Hall of Fame. Oh, Jim Kelly. Wow. Yeah. So uh, and I met Jim Kelly and went to some of the Bills parties and met quite a few of the Bills and worked out at their facility. So I had a good time. I had a good time playing. Francie, there there's a lot of uh, great sports players. There's your next audio series, uh, The Adventures of Ray Carr. That's right. It sounds like a great one. I mean, I am doing, although, Ray, you really need to, in order to get my current um, projects, I'm working on something called uh, Playing Dirty Sports Scandals for iHeartRadio. I'm writing it. It's it's already been released in pieces. There's going to be 40 episodes, um, again, with Jen Brown, my producing partner. And this one, Ray, is, I think, would interest you. It's, it's um, sort of uh, sports scandals. So it's a real mesh of sports and crime. So for me to do the Ray Carr story, you're going to have to go bad, I think, first, Ray. <laughs> I could do that. I, you know, I, I'm <laughs> not going to do anything bad here, Francie. I'm just, you know, but I can well, give I you some not. of the bad parts. <laughs> nice. Hey, Francie, would one of those stories be the NBA referee in about uh, 2007 who was throwing some games, working with some mobsters? Yeah, we, we wanted to do that one. Fits. We wanted to do that one. But what here's what's funny. When you're working with a network, you know, they sort of dictate and they tell you kind of the theme of things that they're interested in and and the theme of things that they aren't. And there are actually quite a few scandals, sports scandals involving throwing games, betting on games. Pete Rose was one we tried to get them to let us do. And some of these other, um, you know, bad refs. Um, but no, we do not have any of those. Ours are all 40 of them. There's, well, there's, um, 
at least two episodes for each scandal, and a couple of them have you know more than that. But we are, we're doing you know the Jerry Sandusky scandal and Larry Nasser and Ray Carruth, and so some of them are, are, are I mean they're just very very dramatic. We just did one with uh, Robert Rozier, who I don't know if y'all know, but he was uh, a football player who then joined Yahweh Ben Yahweh's cult in South Florida and then murdered and dismembered like seven people mm-hmm. for the cult after he left football. So some, so stories like that are, are kind of the subject of playing. I'm here. trying to think, and, and you may want to look into this, Francie, there was a serial killer who played with the Vikings, tried out with the Vikings, didn't make it. I think they called him the I-5 killer up, up in Minnesota oh. or California, maybe. I'll have to check that and out. And he wound up getting cut, but he wanted to let people know he was still somebody. And if, <laughs> what I'll do is uh, I'll send you an email with his name. Great. And he might yeah, be someone great. that might be, Thank you. might be worth looking into. Always looking for good sports scandals about athletes gone bad. Mm-hmm. Tiger yeah, Woods and- is going to be our final episodes, I think, in that series. <clears throat> oh, interesting. In my last year as a profiler in 07, that case broke out of New York City. And it was kind of you know, very hush hush, and and uh, they had me do some behavioral analysis of the best interview techniques for this guy and uh, this referee, whatever. And finally, the whole thing, uh, you know, broke, and he was arrested, and he no longer refs any games. So well, maybe season uh, two, was a Philly guy. Maybe season two. What's that, Ray? He was a Philly guy. He You're was right. from Philadelphia. He, he was, was from Delaware County. So we, you know, a lot of people that I knew knew him. I didn't personally know him. But a lot of people knew him. Interesting. Francie, we're, uh, we, we th- very much thank you for your time. Anything we didn't, website information, anything else you want to throw out there? Let us know what you're doing. No, I don't think so. I mean, just check out my podcast, Best Case, Worst Case. And, you know, you can follow me on Instagram at Francie Hakes and at Twitter. I do a lot of legal analysis on TV of all the latest sort of trials and tribulations of the court system still going on today you know newsmax and fox news and news nation and um all those kind of outlets and uh yeah thanks so much for having me i really appreciate it well your your expertise can become lawfare because there's certainly uh, (laughs) a good bit of that going around and uh i don't think it's going away anytime soon but um sadly but look uh thank you again ray are you good to um i'm good thank you francie Thanks, thank Ray. you so Great much. You. You're going to take uh, us out, Jim? I will take us out. Uh, thanks for the number of invites, of course, to Best Case, Worst Case, a great scenario with our mutual friend, Jim Clemente. And I want to thank everyone else here for listening and or watching uh, uh, Cold Red tonight. Make sure to subscribe to the Cold Red podcast and follow us on all Cold Red podcast social media platforms and coldredpodcast.com. And, uh, yeah, subscriptions mean a lot to us. And uh, we'll see you with another episode of Cold Red. Until then, stay safe, be aware of your surroundings, because it just might change your life. Thank Rick Schilling, our musical director. The two Matts for uh, producing us. And we'll be back next time for the rest of uh, season four. See you guys.